poetry. We dive deep into our hearts to find a kernel of emotion. And then through our creative use of language, we attempt to evoke that feeling in others. With poetry, we hope to forge a connection, to elicit a nod of understanding, the reassuring flash of recognition that tells us we are not alone. What happens if people do not believe their language is a true language, and poetry is an art form that will never be theirs? What if they finally find their language, their voice, and thus discover their poetry? What if at one special time, in one special place, a perfect storm of creativity is unleashed? Their eloquent hearts can now be shared and perhaps awaken us all. I think it was T. S. Eliot who said, poetry can express itself without truly understanding. I remember reading a quote somewhere, and it said, poetry is like trying to capture the wind. But once it's caught, it's no longer the wind. Emily Dickinson says, how do I know it's poetry? If the top of my head comes off, it's poetry. It's a, it's a dance. It's another language. It truly is another language. I can play with language. I can be creative with it. I don't have to just communicate, you know, just get by with basic communication. I can express myself and I can take in what others express. Every poet offers a vision of what will come. Someone once told me that poetry, it's like taking a lot of different roses and squeezing them together until what you get out of them is one distilled drop of the adder of the rose. It will just grow and change 
getting better and better in the same way that fine wine ages. I think that long ago, primitive people told their stories to others by drawing on cave walls, through art, and by acting things out for each other. I believe man's first language was like watching a movie. For instance, The Tale of the Hunt. I think all it's all going back to Greek times. Let's, for example, take Sappho, great poet. She often had someone use a harp. No mm -mm -mm. poetry became rhythmic. Mm. And they had traveling singers uh, called uh, rap. Swords. Uh, in the Greek, it means a singer. I kept uh, alive in the spirit of poetry. Appreciation of poetry was a wonderful thing. In the old days, in England, Anglo-Saxon language, there was no way to write it down. And there were these traveling troubadours who would gather a circle of people around, and then things that people asked for and things that people said influenced the performance. And then there was the Latin literature that was high culture and was written down on paper, and it was in a book, and therefore it was valorized as better. You know, a long time ago, poetry wasn't written. It was a spoken art form, and the poet had an audience. You have to look at the history of poetry and how it changed over time. It had a completely different style before it was codified to the written page. Its entire nature at that point changed. And just as in olden times, sign language requires an audience as well. And so when we start talking about performance poetry, we're talking about what originally was poetry filtered through the lens of hundreds of years and only hundreds of years of text uh, till the point where a spoken word is something extraordinary and a, um, uh, a text is considered the poem, and those who don't, and, and for poems not in these books, we then rename the original orature as, as uh, oral literature. Lingua means tongue, the root of language, lingua. Literature, litera, means written. Tongue, write, that doesn't really fit with sign. So the problem historically has always been that we look at the ear, and that relates with sounds and words. That's why modern poets are amazed when they see ASL poetry, because they strive to take images and put them into language. Let the words become pictures. That's what we do in ASL poetry. Poetry does not need to be defined as depending merely on sound. Not at all. Rather, it's much broader than that. Sound, sight, taste, all the senses are included. So the long-standing definition that we've had has been much too limiting. Poetry is much more expansive than that.
And down at that, there are monthly literary meetings. They were not meetings, they were shows. Two hours, mostly storytelling. Everybody liked that. Another person, very important person, my old friend who was with me, I can't have that, Mark Acorn. It had been very staid, formal like. The signing was like extremely controlled. Then when I came on the scene with Jabberwocky, I started running all over the stage. I broke that mold. It really shook up the signing world. Everything was quite standard until I came along. One night, he popped up in my dormer room, said, Bob, sit down. I want to show you something. You know, next Friday night, we have a lit society meeting. In the poetry signing, I'm going to sign the poem, uh, Da Saba Waki. I said, uh, you think they will understand you? Sit down and watch, mm, watch when my mouth begins. I was mesmerized. I finished. I stood up. I said, my God, it's marvelous. Something out of this world. was brillig, Brilliant. and the slithy toes, the gyre and gimble in the way. <laughs> All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mummerath of grave. <laughs> Beware the jabberwock. Son, his jaws that bite, his claws that scratch. <laughs> Beware the jub jub bird <laughs> and shun the frumious bandersnatch. <laughs> Wow. Before Malls, the signing was so formal and controlled. He was completely different. He took a different path. I created that when I was 17. It was back in 1939, 1939. People weren't ready for that yet. One third of the audience, they thought I was crazy. Another third thought I was a genius. The last third couldn't figure out which. I became deaf at 10. So I was a good reader before that. I loved books. So my command of English was well established. Coming from Italian family, and my father loved opera. He played the guitar and the flute, and he had gotten me singing Italian songs when I was three, four years old. Everybody said I had a wonderful voice. Mm. And Duff, father throws out uh, the guitar and start playing the flute at home. Uh. And I mean, no music left. My ears are deaf, but still I seem to hear sweet nature's music and the songs of men. For I have learned from fancies other than how written words can thrill the inner ear. Just as they move the heart, 
and so for me. Words also seem to ring out loud and free. In silent study, I have learned to tell each sacred shade of meaning and to hear a maverick harmony at once sincere that somehow notes the tinkle of a bow, the cooing of a dove, the swish of leaves, the raindrops putter potter on the eaves, the lover's sigh and drumming of guitar. And if I choose the rustle of a star, Graduated, got a job teaching English in school for the deaf of Fanwood. Bernard Bragg was one of my students. Oh, he fell in love with my way of signing. We set up the drama club. Very successful. I never told him anything about acting. He was natural. I got my MA from NYU. Gallaudet asked me to come and teach. Again, I told Bragg at Gallaudet College. Well, my father was an actor, and he was actually a poet. The way he described things, it would show up in his sign language as well. He was such a beautiful, sensual signer. If he was talking about how the water would tumble down a creek, when he spoke about the way the water would go over the rocks, he would describe the rock as being like a strong man letting the water pound his hunched shoulder, or if the stream was more gentle, like a woman washing her hands. I think it was my father who had the largest influence on me, but I have to say that Bob Panera ingrained the importance of English. I had the sign input from my dad and the English from Bob Panera, and I feel that it's both their contributions who made me who I am. Marcel Marceau invited me to study mime with him in Paris. I created another performance technique based on his method. I developed something that I called VV. It is a form of mime. It is not really a traditional mime structure. I changed it into a smaller frame size and utilized film techniques. I used cuts and edits, close-ups and long shots. I started that style and I called it visual vernacular for lack of a better term.
that the National Theater for the Deaf? I think it was Dorothy Miles who started really playing with signs. All my life I've been writing poetry. When I first saw the National Theater of the Deaf in 1967, first year, I saw what they were doing with the sign language, things that they'd never dreamed of, and I went home and started to write poetry and complained English language and the same. And that was my first real honest to goodness poetry. Before that, I wrote some verse, and it was all so exciting for me. And I decided at that time, because I'd always been in theatre all my life, I decided I was going to join the National Theatre of the Deaf and found you there, um, I did. How much is the knife? Oh, it's good and straight. You want to cut your throat with it? How about it? I'll give it to you as cheap as anyone else. Your death will be cheap, but not for nothing. How about it? You'll have an economical death. NTD was like another school for the deaf. Because most of the actors were deaf. And most of them had deaf parents. And they passed down a strong cultural lineage that they were coming from. The only hearing folks were the voice actors and the director. Also, since our audiences were predominantly hearing, 85% of them, NTD subscribed to the philosophy of see and hear every word. All the things I got from the National Theatre of the Deaf helped me even the fact that I just waited for some of the things I did for the signs. For example, I, I felt that sometimes I made the signs just a demonstration, beautiful thing, separate from my personal feeling. And I believe that that deaf people should be doing both of them together, feeling and thing. Around 1970, many of us began to notice ASL poetry. Original ASL poetry. It had not been written and then translated from English into sign, but this poetry had been generated in our own language. It was just beginning to emerge at that time. The question has to be asked, why hadn't this occurred before?
Well, in 1960, a hearing linguist named William Stokey began carefully observing deaf people communicating with one another, and he decided to ignore the dismissive ways people had labeled sign language in the past, such as broken English or substandard language. He put those labels aside. And using comparative linguistic studies, he determined that sign language followed all the same principles and rules as other bona fide languages. It was a tough stand for him to take. People laughed in his face, and they thought he was crazy. But he was stubbornly persistent. He clung to his conclusions, and subsequent research has validated all of his findings. You know, all my life I had grown up and never really thought about this. I was confused. I was comfortable and fluent in my sign language and what we all used. But English was a language of the greater world. As I grew up, I was taught to read and write it. Sign language was different. It's the language of a very small group of people. The message was always that one must learn English to succeed in the greater world. And we devalued sign language. I was born in Kansas, the fifth of seven children, five of whom were deaf. With five deaf kids all together, you can imagine we signed like crazy to each other. Now, my parents and the two hearing sisters spoke and had their own separate communication. We had two different languages and two different cultures in the same house. While I was at Gallaudet, the announcement was made that ASL was equal to English. But inside I was confused. I saw all these people saying, no, that's not true. ASL's a bad language, they just made that up. But at the same time, I felt that it meant that ASL, although it was in the dorm, it didn't only have to be there, it could be brought into the classroom too. I was excited, but perplexed. I wanted it to happen. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. S smoke. And the liftoff of the Challenger inspired me. One minute, 49 seconds later, explosion and my heart halted. The MAME shuttle descended, and with it my heart. It dawned upon me, a flashback, a memory. 1963, mm. President Kennedy was shot, his head blown to bits, his body falling downward, and with it my tears. Signing in English meant you were smart. Native signing was looked on as cute or quaint, an extremely patronizing attitude. The legacy of oralism perpetuated that negative view of ASL. It was only by speaking and using English signs that one could prove they were intelligent. The oppression was tragic, leaving no pride in our language whatsoever. Well, you know, it's interesting because that parallels so many other kinds of voices coming forward. I mean, there was a time when it was the same with women poets, you know, like, Poetry is the language of men, I mean, as seen by the men, you know, and the, you know, the woman's voice, you know, it should be in the home, it should be about nurturing and raising children, but it should not be about the world. In the 50s and 60s, there was women claiming their voices and the establishment saying that's really not worthy of being seen as, as great poetry. And the same thing with other groups like that, that have just discovered their voices and the overriding academic structure saying, no, that's not, we know what is good poetry, and it's these white men, you know, who are the ones that can do it. Allen Ginsberg said he had learned from Pound that golden ages of poetry were always happening when traditional, academic, formal, official language, um, dominant language states were uh, hit with vernacular, street, 
language um, of the people. Whom bum? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whom bum? We bum you. Whom bum? You bum you. Whom bum? You bum you. Who wants a bomb? We don't want a bomb. Who wants a bomb? We don't want a bomb. Who wants a bomb? We don't want a bomb. Who wants a bomb? We don't want a, we don't want a, we don't want a bomb. English, 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 English. English manacled my hands. Freedom, 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 freedom in signs. A common experience that many people who were ASL poets back in the 1970s and 80s shared was extensive oral training. So that found its way into the deaf experience of being taught to speech, read, and speak. And as a result, that comes up as a theme frequently in the ASL poetry. Talk, talk, talk. Speak and tell me what is your name. I looked up with saucer eyes and spoke. My name is. He can talk. Again, a speech lesson. I talked in signs. Punishment. Mitts tied together. Line up. Now, sit. The captain with his whip in hand and flicks his sentence. Speak. 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 Little Debbie. <laughs> Headphones on. Wired into jarring, mechanical, garbled decibels. I looked to my teacher standing beside me. Suddenly, she grabbed the headphones from me. The headphones, the headphones, the headphones. She grabbed them. What is it, I said? What, what? A tear slid down her face. The president's dude. The president's dude. The president's dude. I couldn't understand her words. <laughs> All of my life I've loved two things, language and theater. Both have always held a special fascination for me. I've heard stories from the time I was very young that my mother, who was deaf, would focus all of her attention explaining the world to me and infusing language in everyday activities. When I was a baby, she would sign and spell words to me, like the sign for milk. She would spell it M-I-L-K. I was fascinated by her tireless efforts. Bernard Bragg taught at the school for the deaf nearby. He recalls a time seeing me as a toddler walking with my mother around one years of age, and my mother would see a tree and spell tree, T-R-E-E. -E. The summer when I was 14 or so, I took a summer program taught by Bragg and Malls and some other deaf performers. It was called Creative Language Use or something like that. Bernard Bragg, you know, his method of signing was very studied and stayed, so quiet and smooth. Maltz was not a great signer, but he was very creative. San Fran. Cisco. 
Sam, Fran, Cisco. I feel so fortunate that I had these two amazing influences on me. Getting the technique and the creativity from the two of them was wonderful double exposure for me. I tried to start signing some of my poems, doing experimentation with it, figuring out which rules, like subject, verb, object, order, signing in cycles, how things worked spatially. But I thought, why not take these rules and apply them to my own poetry? Why not, right? When you analyze written poetry, you see that within the creativity of it, there are certain rules and structures dictated by the language itself. ASL has these formal structures. Why not use it for poetry? Out of the darkness of time grows the murmur of the millions. Except from one, oddly different, the crowd stared and cried out, deaf. Doors slammed, sentencing separation, locking in isolation, so they thought. Until the one found another, deafness, a bond, not a barrier. More joined us as we discovered our articulate hands and we talked in relief in our freedom of signs. When, storm by anthem-driven soldiers, pitched to fever by the strength of their regime. Follow me. Line up. Now, sit. The captain with his whip in hand inflicts his sentence. Speak. 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 Damn your chains. We'll pronounce our own deliverance and lock you out from lives you will not dominate. And in the space of our silence, we grant each other sanctuary, speaking easily in the language that is ours. When again, there was a pounding from beyond. A pounding. Don't answer. Don't open. The pounding was insistent. But I wonder, I don't know, I just want to see. And so step by step we succumb, our silent agreement undone. I would like to welcome you all to come out of your dark and silent world and join us in our bright and lovely world. Those who are here are signing. Yes, but such queer signs they shape. What waits out there? Perhaps there's something we should see. Be careful. Could it be they now have different strengths? Cautiously. We walk forward into the sterile, narrow corridors. The unknown maze seems endless. And it is constricting us. We try to run, retreat, but we cannot find the safety of our sanctuary. And so we walk alone not knowing, and the pressure stifles us until it lightens with the brightness of someone beckoning. Burdens fall away as we find ourselves released. There soon will come a time when war gives way to peace. When what was misconstrued is communicated and enemies become friends, guns are beaten into plowshares, the soon will come to pass. A lot about modern life makes its way into poetry. It's a reflection. Artists tell us what life is like before we even realize it. It's their role to see things, and express them before we can understand them completely. They don't come after the changes. They come before. Deaf poetry, I feel, 
should reflect our collective experience. That's my perspective anyway. The deaf world is my home base. It's who I am. I do teach hearing people. I interact with the hearing world, of course. But deafness is my soul, my turf. It's my world. Valley sort of generated on his own. When I was 12 years old, our classroom teacher handed out a sheet of poetry. I was fascinated by the strong images. All my previous experiences with writing and reading English had really been a struggle, and frankly, I just didn't get it. If we went to go see poetry, we'd freak out. Because it was just like in the classroom. The teacher would drill us, making us memorize the poetry in English. I mean, reading and understanding the English was so very difficult. So anytime anybody mentioned poetry, we freaked out. Later, I said to myself, let's give this poetry writing thing another try and see how it goes. So I gave it my best, but it was tough and I struggled so much with the whole language medium. Still, I showed my efforts to my teacher, but her expression made it obvious that my writing was less than successful. I totally lost enthusiasm. Later still, when I was about 20 or 21, I was a student at NTID, and I noticed that that same inner drive was still there. I'd experienced it first when I was 12, and many years later, it was still burning within me. So I said, well, let's try again. So I wrote some poetry, but it was still a struggle, and it was still frustrating. So I put all that aside, and I said, why don't we try ASL poetry and see how that works? So I began signing, and it came so much more naturally. But did I say anything to my friends out there? Hey, do you know what I'm doing? Not at all. I kept it all repressed within. I met Clayton, and we had an instantaneous connection. He showed me his work, which I thought was fantastic. Wow. I knew he was already deep into studying and researching linguistics, and he was truly engaged with it. His personality was captivating. Hand shapes could be used. You could just limit them to three or four, narrow down, tighten your control, and focus on which signs you'd use to make a poetic point as well. I would like for you to read the poem first, and then I will perform it. There won't be any voice. I think it will be a different kind of approach for you to see the poem without any sound. So I'll give you a chance to read it first.
I was born hearing, but I became deaf at the age of three because I had come down with spinal meningitis. I don't remember much about what sound is, but I suspect it's in the back of my brain somewhere. I remember when I got home from the hospital after my illness, my mother came up to me and started speaking to me. And I thought, oh, funny mommy, she has no voice. It must be broken. You're funny, your voice is broken. And then I went up to my father and he started talking to me. Well, he didn't have a voice either. And it was so funny, his voice was broken too. I had a dog at the time and he's barking at me. Well, that seems strange. He didn't have a voice either because his voice was broken. So I went over to the TV set and turned up the volume louder and louder and louder. And I realized I was the one who was broken. It was a very frustrating time. There was no communication at all. I don't remember this, but my parents tell me my speech deteriorated immediately. They put me in the New Jersey School for the Deaf for three years, but my parents weren't satisfied. So they transferred me to the Clark School for the Deaf, which is an oral school where signing is not allowed. I was there for nine years, and when I graduated, I went to a private high school in Pennsylvania that was not mainstreamed. National Association of the Deaf is where I met Bernard Bragg. He gave a workshop on VV. You know his story of the hunter and the dog? I was amazed. Everything happened as he stayed in one place. He went back and forth becoming the characters and not moving an inch. I was completely fascinated. It was so clear. It was like watching a movie. Visual vernacular is the foundation of everything I do. We've got runners on first and third. He goes into the stretch. Eyes the runner leading off first base. <laughs> and looks back the man off third. <laughs> He reaches back and delivers. For college, I checked out both NTID and Gallaudet. But I chose NTID because they had such a strong art program for my major. From the moment I got there, it was a new world. I felt like a BAD, born again deaf. Deaf people often wonder, where's my home? We don't automatically have one, we have to find it. And that's part of our life story, is we have to find our own home. If a person is not born into a deaf family, traditionally the way they go about finding that home is through the deaf schools and oftentimes that experience comes up in the ASL poetry. Every Sunday. Ah, that smokestack, red brick. Kansas School for the Deaf. Lovingly did he replant them in a garden, the deaf school, scared and shocked. They stared at each other, slowly realizing they are family of common language. My first term at school, I got involved with the theater in this play, The Tempest, and I played this character called Caliban, who's half animal and half man. Well, the reason why I was chosen was because my sign language was so bad. But they said, that's great, don't learn anymore, don't get any better. You know, to this day, I don't know if that was a backhanded compliment or not. Still makes me wonder. But in any case, it was a great experience. 
My first two years in college, I was in a performance group called Heavy Maze. It was like an underground group. We'd throw these parties and we thought, hey, why not have a performance party with just our friends? I didn't come up with the ideas for the performances myself. I was inspired by the comic book Heavy Metal. There are these wonderful stories and these wild pictures in these comic books, like people riding on these big prehistoric birds. So anyway, we'd have a party and everybody would take turns trying to figure out how to sign these things. And it was so much fun. And it started to get popular. And more and more people started coming. And we would practice and figure out how to sign things together. Everybody throwing in ideas and playing with the signs. It really took off and the audiences grew. So Jim, Jim Cohn, he approaches me one day afterwards. He comes up to me and he says, Hey, that was, that was cool. That was good performance. You know, I, I really like your poetry. And in my mind, I go, what? Uh, poetry? But, you know, I do have to thank Jim for encouraging me. Without him, I wouldn't even be here today. What? Poetry? No. Allen Ginsberg founded the Neuropa Institute with Ann Waldman. The Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics was founded in 1974 in Boulder, Colorado. Allen was a disciple of Trungpa Rinpoche. I had read as a student the Chinese written word as a medium for poetry by Ernest Fenelosa and Ezra Pound that it really interested me about the representational aspect of Chinese written word as a medium for poetic expression, sort of the representational aspect where a word visualizes somehow or represents somehow what it is about. So I got here in 1982. I was in a two-year program here. I think the early part of my time during that program was trying to connect with the poetry scene of Rochester itself. And that was all sort of around Joe Flaherty's Writers and Books Literary Center in Rochester. When we moved to this building, which was in 1985, we had three floors of space uh, and, and a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things. And suddenly there was, there was a real awareness in Rochester that there was uh, a place to go where you could have, you know, give a reading or, or listen to other poets or, or fiction writers. And so we had a lot of people coming. One of those people, you know, was Jim Cohn. So, I mean, Jim was a kind of a real bridge between the two communities, uh, you know, uh, being a poet himself uh, and also being out at MTID. So the whole kind of deaf party scene of that time in the early 80s around here, particularly on this campus, was, I think, very heady. Uh, it was like every school was a, a poetry slam. and. So this was like the um, big American slam sort of staging of it all at that point, at that moment. He's so tenacious. He kept coming at me, you know, even if I was walking on the, uh, oh, what's that place RIT calls it, the quarter mile? Anyway, I'd be walking and I'd see him coming and try to get away from him, but his radar was on me and I'd get nailed every time. He keeps coming after me and little by little he catches my attention and I thought, huh, you know what he says is, is pretty interesting. Not so bad. He's not drunk. One day uh, the poet Sam Abrams asked me if I had any activities planned for a visit by Allen Ginsberg to Rochester to do reading in the community and also at the institute here. I thought, well, um, yeah, I might like to try to see if I could set up a uh, a meeting with Allen Ginsberg and the, the poet Robert Panera, and they could sort of workshop together, and uh, that might be interesting to the poets and language artists here on campus. Allen Ginsberg, plop, plop, it 
was like Walt Whitman coming to NTID. <laughs> So I thought, Robert Panera is going to meet Allen Ginsberg? That's amazing. I have to go. I mean, I had no idea that was going to be the day that changed my life. 360 degrees. I mean, totally turned me around. I knew that Bob Panera and Allen Ginsberg were going to be having this sort of summit because Jim Cohn had let me know that maybe it was something that was worthwhile going to. I had no idea of what was going to happen. I thought that we might just go and compare their styles. It was a class for my interpreting uh, studies that I, somehow I had arranged that the curriculum for that day would be this one workshop. These are Australian Aborigine song sticks. And this is the oldest form of poetry in the world. But their method was very simple, rhythmic uh, repetition. He did this rhythmic movement with these sticks, and I was fascinated because I thought, well, that's not language. How could that be poetry? Then I thought, wait a minute. Maybe poetry isn't always connected specifically with language. Maybe the word poetry can be applied to painting or music, and not always with words and language. 20th century poetry is mostly picture and idea. So modern poetry, especially after Ezra Pound and William Carlos Williams and the imagist poets, is almost specifically tailored for those who are deaf. One traditional poetry, we gave him examples. I want to see some of a new. And when he talked about that poem, Our. Who sat all night in submarine light of Bickford's cafeteria, <coughs> floated out on the street, and sat through the stale beer afternoon in desolate beer bars, listening to the crack of doom on the hydrogen jukebox. <laughs> so now what's, what is a hydrogen jukebox in sign language? A hydrogen jukebox. Of course, that refers to a sound thing, the jukebox, anyway. It's a jukebox is a record a mechanical record machine in the bars. I understand that, but why do you pick that word, hydrogen? Oh, the hydrogen, the hydrogen bomb. The noise of the jukebox is apocalyptic. So the emergence of that kind of rock and roll and that kind of heavy noise is almost like the beginning of the explosion of the end of the world. <laughs> Once it is explained, does any kind of uh, interesting sparkle come through with that combination? Or does that go dead in translation? At least in translation. Isn't it? Let me try. <laughs> that looks like it. Yeah. That looks like it. <laughs> at that moment, I looked at Alan's eyes and he said, That's it. It really hit me. That means that I can play with sign. Translation can even involve that element of play. I'm not bound by word-for-word -word English. It was like the top of my head just came off. I mean, my eyes fell right out of their sockets, and I thought, wow. What the beat poets uh, did was to free the word from the confines of the um, academic traditions uh, 
and, uh, and open it up both to the worlds of Bohemia and to the event of the poetry reading. Okay, at that time, after that particular workshop, Jim approached me again. He's a very strategically oriented person. He plans things step by step, and I felt like he had some sort of master plan already in mind. You know, I think we essentially, we would just sort of go back and forth about, hey man, I want you to do this poetry. You know, I'd like you to try this. He gave me this book of his work, and it was called Bird Brain. I looked at it, and that was my first, okay, I am going to do this. I'm going to create the image and divorce myself from the English. So I tried it, and it was so much fun. Somehow, I thought it would be really good to take the energy from that and start uh, an ASL poetry series. The Cellar. We decided to start up the Bird Brain Society in the cellar at NTID, down in the tunnels underneath the dorms. There was a bar that everybody went to all the time. I think we held it on Wednesday nights. Lots of people came. Everybody was doing stories and creative signing, all kinds of performances. Everybody took turns. The Bird Brain Society was not all poetry. Sometimes there was storytelling, and sometimes there were skits. You know, short skits. But, really, it was about playing with language. It was about playing with ASL, and there was no voice, no interpreter, nothing. If you want to go, you go. So Jim invited me to attend the Bird Brain Society down in the cellar here at RIT. So I thought that that was a fine thing to do, and I went and watched Peter Cook as he was doing his poetry, and I was blown away. The poetry was there. Next, Debbie Rennie got up and did her poetry. I was eager for it to be my turn. All of these years of translating English texts into sign, and now I could take what was inside me and try to express it in my native language. Peter headlined the first Bird Brain Society poetry reading series, and then there were several after that, and they were well attended. The former clown, mimist, Debbie Rennie, she got involved with that, too. Debbie Rennie was more of a dancer, very big into movement, that flowing, graceful movement that she would use with her body. It was very exciting to watch her. When I was about 12, I went to a school for the deaf. Finally, I didn't have any more struggles, and I wasn't considered handicapped. It was a signing environment, and I was just swimming in a sea of language. It was wonderful. The language was amazing. I felt so at home. I was never a very good lip reader. I just didn't have that skill. When I was a young and innocent girl, I fell madly in love with a hearing man. Oh, I was crazy about him. And he didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was deaf. Oh, I was devastated and I was angry. But I couldn't direct my anger toward him. I loved him. And his friendship was very important to me, so I decided to let my feelings out by writing poetry. I never showed it to anyone. That was just too much to share. While I was in Sunshine too, I translated poetry that others had written, but I hadn't yet become a poet myself. It took a while for me to come into my own as a poet. During my studies, Jim Cohn approached me one day and asked me if I wouldn't mind performing in the Bird's Brain Society. I was shocked. I'd say, man, that was a poem. And 
the people would say, Debbie Renning would say, no, uh, a poem equals English. So I can't, do, I can't possibly be doing that because I have this at best, um, you know, uh, adversarial relationship w with that language. And so I can't possibly be doing poetry. I can't possibly be doing, be a poet. I can't possibly have this identity. I was unsure, but I decided I would finally show the world the poetry I had kept to myself for so long. At that time, I learned a lot and got a lot of feedback from others. Howie Sego told me about Ella's work, and he explained rhythm, timing, hand shapes. It made me realize that I had been focusing on the translation from English, and I really could work in ASL instead. C. A newborn cake. A. L. F. <laughs> Taken C. from its mother and a. chained inside L. a tiny wooden F. crate. C. Force fed with a. drunk bed liquid L. feed, shot up with chloramphenicol. F. All of C. this. Leads to premium milk fat deal for your gourmet dining F. pleasure. There was a lady who taught dance at NTID, and her name was Stepha Z. And Stepha had a great influence on Peter and Debbie. Both of them had taken her classes in dance movement, and they learned a phenomenal amount about how to move their bodies. And it really was incorporated into their styles quite a bit. When I fell into NTID, I fell into a new world. My true teachers were Peter Cook and Kenny Lerner and Debbie Rennie and Patrick Rabel. They taught me that the goal was communicating and reaching out to another human being that was creative and expressive. And I arrived at sign language with that. Ivory Victorian bathtub, green age silver spigot. A woman lies. Piece of old memory. There was a van with a man in it, and the woman said, Excuse me, I don't understand you. Shut up! These Florida speedometer are going wild. Trees blowing by. Hamburg splat. Stop! 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 I don't care! windshield shattering into a million pieces. But it was all in my mind. Driving. Driving. Stop. Driving. Stop. Hammer. Splat. I don't care. I don't, I don't understand. Care. I, don't I don't understand. Care. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Windshield shattering into a million pieces. But it was all in my mind. Driving, driving, um, driving. I don't really understand you. Shut up! He floored it. Trees blurring by. Driving. Splat! Stop! 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 I don't care! Windshield shattered. But it was all in my mind. Driving, trees, driving, trees. Hamburg. Splat! Hamburg! Black! Hamburg! Black! But it was Stop. all in my mind. Stop! Stop! Stop!
The deaf end of things was really starting to coalesce into this uh, almost like breakthrough sense of like, wow, yeah, I think, I think it's politically important to me. Um, I think the poets might have been thinking something like this. This is a political act for me to do ASL poetry. It was a breakthrough moment that ASL equaled poetry and poetry might equal ASL. Just as it was Ginsburg fighting uh, for gay rights, uh, fighting against the war in Vietnam, so do the ASL poets in their very life fight for the existence of the deaf community, of uh, a minority whose voice isn't being heard. I remember Jim coming up to me again and he said, you have to go out into the hearing community, writers and books. There was, you know, a, a kind of a communication going on that people who were, uh, you know, who were writers, who were poets, and also out there in the deaf community knew that there was, there was a way to kind of, you know, kind of get across this gap here and, and uh, somehow get the two audiences together. And I said, well, how is my stuff going to be voiced? And Jim says, I have the perfect person for you. And I said, really? Great. But the problem was, I wasn't an interpreter. I didn't know how to voice that well. And I wasn't really that good at sign language. So someone knocks on my door, and I open it up to see this guy. And in my mind, I remember this big bearded guy sitting way in the back corner of the cellar with a whole bunch of empty beers on the table. And now, all of a sudden, here he is at my door. That's how we met. We started goofing around and dissing on each other back and forth, but we had this instantaneous connection. We never really planned to create together, and we never decided to become a team. We just connected. The beat poets were after images, trying to find the words to convey strong pictures and not rely on the sounds to do the work for them, but the right word itself. It was like a, um, a tapestry of images and words and knowledge that they were weaving all together. And I think what we're doing is the same, taking the images we see and embodying them with signs or movements weaving them together in a parallel way, just like the beats did. I can play with language. A language, 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 language. Yeah. Poetry, poetry, poetry is the shot orbiting, circling, revolving, exploding. It's the open window. It's caught smoking, smoking. It's the flame. And it tastes delicious. It's loaded into the magnum and it's shot right back into your heart. That's poetry. Poetry. It's the painter and the portrait. into the portrait. It's the paper ripped off the easel and crumpled up. <laughs> ah! And then thrown into orbit. It's a forest of trees. Wishes, 
underbrush. A blazing sun. A red-tailed falcon rising up towards the sourceful sun, bursting out, sunbathed red falcon, swoops down. It's a butterfly. its reflection <clears throat> in the river. Poetry. <laughs> it's the Bombay <laughs> doors opening the mushroom cloud. The nuclear winds Disintegrating hair, eyes, clattering teeth, bones, he's gone! I knew right away what my philosophy would be. I knew that the art was on his body, and I didn't want my words or my voice to distract the hearing audience. I wanted the attention on him. I think when Debbie sort of took up the challenge uh, during the Bird Brain Society to get out her poetry, she needed somebody to be her voice as well. And uh, she chose Donna Kachitas, who was an exceedingly gifted poetic interpreter. And they bonded in the same way that Kenny Lerner and Peter Cook bonded. We had something friends have. You know, sometimes you meet someone and you just know that person will be your friend. And that's what happened when we met each other. My poetry. Well, I would perform my poetry. And I would videotape it. And I would take the videotape and I would give it to Donna Kachitas. And she would watch the performance and write down the words. And then we would read it together and decide what worked or not. In the beginning, I used too many words, and Kenny didn't use enough. I think we evened out eventually, so that we were each voicing about the same amount. We were trying to figure it out as we went along. We were going by experience, trying things in performances, and asking for feedback about what worked and what didn't, and then modified accordingly. I'd like to show you a handshape poem, and it's called Swan. A solitary tree whispers its reflection in the calmly rippling pond. A majestic swan flies through the air, swoops down, skims the surface, splashes, then settles herself. In her comforting water nest, she regally glides. We had discussions. Well, you know, there were a lot of controversies about whether it was right or not, you know, to be having a voice speak the poetry at the same time. But I really think it was worthwhile for the community to have everybody involved. There was a club in Rochester called Jazzberries in an old fire station down on Monroe Avenue that had given us permission to sort of start a series there as well, poetry series. And so uh, the Rochester poets, uh, the circle I had become involved with initially here in town, really started experimental stage for introducing sign language interpreters to a, a hearing audience. And then by doing that, 
uh, allowing deaf audience members to come and start sort of seeing what was what the hearing poets were doing and not just sitting there reading pieces of paper but understanding what those words were saying. It seemed like the interpreters were getting more exposure. They kind of knew what deaf people like and what they don't like, so they were becoming more aware of how to make those cultural negotiations. Whenever I'd get the poems, the first time I saw them, I would always look at them and just feel like, these poems are impossible. There's no way that I'm going to be able to translate them. But, you know, I'd sit down and think about them and try to figure out the meaning, and eventually through that process, images would start to come to mind, and I'd somehow interpret them. Poetry is about form and about the way form and meaning interact and weave together. It's about the way form and meaning shape each other. But in translation, the form is removed and an entirely new form is placed upon the meaning. So if the poet's intention is to play with form, language, and meaning, when 50% of that is taken away, the poetry is lost. I don't think we slept much back then. And we would get together and the interpreter would spend an hour with the poet, just going over, now what does this line mean? What does this line mean? How do you want it interpreted? And if it had more than one meaning, do we have to do both meanings? People would ask such, such wonderful questions about the poems and make you think more about your own meanings in a way that maybe you hadn't. But how do you do justice to the original poem, regardless of whether it's in English or in ASL? That's the big question. But I did benefit from watching the interpreters, because they were not signing word for word. If it were word for word, that wouldn't help me at all. How brave how brave an interpreter is, and to have my poetry worn by someone is what an honor that was for me, especially as a young poet, or as, even as just as a young man, to have someone take my art that seriously and to um, experience it. There is no poem unless there's somebody else there to see it. And, uh, you know, so it's all up to you the translator. Not a bad idea in the kitchen making almond cakes and pies. What a pleasant surprise. Go ahead and take a taste. One tiny slice. How nice. Bring <laughs> in In the dream, reflecting pool in a small park, facing San Francisco City Hall during the June 12, 1982 disarmament at a nuclear rally. A bare-chested boy, lying on his back, arms behind his head, eyes closed, so fast. As speaker after speaker gives an inspiring talk and the crowd roars and applauds, all faces turn over the stage. The boy lies there for last week, seagulls, does he hear the great pleas for peace, or is he dozing? Perhaps he was listening before, behind his closed eyes, his dream love girl or boy appeared and glowed and gleamed. How many loving eyes caress this vision that does not see it? How many strolling? from the rat crowd to rest their ears from the anti-war fervor they so much agree with and which inspires so many of their poems come upon this vision and are overcome 
of the dazzling sight of needed boyhood, armpits and chest and belly and face that would bring to its Essentially, I was seeing a dream of a golden age unfold right before my eyes, and essentially I was just walking through it. So there was things happening in different parts of the country, uh, which I was aware of, but seeing this, it really struck me that this is something very unique, not happening anywhere else, and, you know, something that grew out of Rochester. Jim wanted to invite folks from all over the country to convene a formal conference about ASL poetry. He invited Ella Mae Lentz, Clayton Valley, Peter Cook, Debbie Rennie, and Patrick Graybill. Somehow we got the bread. Um, we had a really wonderful administrative person at NTID around that time, Adele Friedman. She understood in, just intuitively that this was really important and sort of brokered the deal that would allow uh, us to try and sort of pull off a national poetry conference. So Valley and Ella and a lot of different people who attended that at the same time felt that they were departing from English as a group. There were the five of us, and we felt that finally we had found each other. And all of us had this poetic expression. And I felt that Valley really believed in us, and he could see that what we were doing really was poetry. And he really supported that poetic expression. If it was going to be a legitimate language, it had to have a literature. And then, of course, the argument is, what's the canon? What's legitimate literature? And if it doesn't look like Robert Frost, are we going to get legitimacy for it? <laughs> Mindless, heartless, and dark lives. Suicide prone, obsessed for life. Where? They walk all day, all night, looking for something that they don't know. Hello-less, goodbye-less, dark lives. Laugh seldom, if ever, cry at times. They gaze at nothing all day all day, hoping for somebody they could love. Music of the telephone wires like music sheets with lines that rise and quiver and sway and lower along with the passing of space and time. No ears needed to hear, nor any instruments to play. Eyes are the ears, and the piano and the flute are the wires, and the occasional pole is the drum. Boom, boom. Here is one bold, wandering wire. And now here are five dancing high and low in turns with poles. And five disappearing into one again and then a crowd overlapping quickly and then slowly. So beautiful to the eye and heart. One wonders what happens inside?
walking through the streets of the city, jostled by a businessman, an old woman. <laughs> Buildings up to the sky. Car fumes choke me. Into the subway. And over by the newsstand, there it was, chocolate. <laughs> Swiss chocolate with hazelnut cream filling. <laughs> Only 39 cents. <laughs> No, I mustn't. Okay, I went over to the magazine rack. Playgirl, Playboy. Ah. Play Chuck. Play <laughs> Chuck. A Hershey's bar with a foil undone. <laughs> Nestle's Crunch Bar. <laughs> and then special dark chocolate completely naked. <laughs> I put the magazine aside. No, 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 no. Get my newspaper and get in line. Chocolate. 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 I couldn't resist anymore. I grabbed a piece, set it on the counter. No bag, thanks. Grab my things. A train pulls out. I get in. Doors slatter shut, and we're off. Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> I couldn't take any more. I devoured it. <laughs> yes, that's what I did. <laughs> Glasses and beard <laughs> coming down, toe coming close to touch. The ice cold water chills its way up the legs, freezing sensation up towards scrotum tucked in, stomach pulled in. Chattering teeth submerged and out. Everything that happened previously was very interesting, but there was a turning point. And everything just exploded, really. It hit me. I wish we could have another ASL poetry conference. I so wish that. What had essentially happened, which would be this cross-cultural exchange and this transmission of beat energy and beat traditions. So you had the early sort of poetic careers of Peter Cook and Kenny Lerner, Donica Cheetahs and Debbie Rennie, and myself as sort of the odd man out in all ways you could imagine, like forming a little troupe uh, called Bridge Of. You know when you go camping, but you don't have a tent? So instead, 
you lean something against a tree. Well, Peter loved the English words lean to. And he thought it'd be really cool if we could come up with a name like that. Well, and the bridge part is obvious. A bridge connecting the lands of the deaf and the hearing on opposite shores of a river. You know, in some ways I could match with Debbie better, and in some ways I could match better with Kenny. But what happened is we all went our separate ways from this group, and we all became more of who we are. Jim moved on, Debbie moved on, Kenny and I moved on. Everybody sort of moved on in their own way. And this time served as an opportunity for reflection and a realization, an impetus for all of us to become more of the individuals we were to become. Even beyond the uniqueness of seeing deaf poetry performed uh, with American Sign Language, and even more of a kind of a body movement, there was the other aspect of it, which was having it interpreted for the hearing. And the two of them together made it even more unique for me, and I thought, this is wonderful, this is, this is great, it's, it's, it's something that's grown out of here, this is our own thing in Rochester. We had a conference here when it was done in collaboration with New York State Council on the Arts. You're visiting Rochester, many of you, for the first time. One of the really unique things about Rochester is that we have the highest per capita deaf community in the entire country here. And also, there is a kind of poetry that's grown up out of this that I would like you to experience. Anyway, we perform this poem to the audience and we're all done, and we meet a lot of people and this one guy comes up to us. His name was Gregory Kalavakis, and he said, Hello, my name is Gregory. I work for the New York Arts Council. I'm in the Lit Division, and I want to give you money. And I said, <laughs> Okay, fine. Lay it on me. I'll take it. And he said, No, no, I'm serious. I can get you grants. I want to give you money. If you write a grant, we will give you the money for it. And I said, Well, we don't have any experience doing this. And he said, Well, I'll help you. So they gave us a grant to travel around New York State. And Steph Z, the NTID dance teacher, she called me one day, and she was all excited. She says, I've got this great idea for a name for you guys. How about Flying Words Project? And Peter loved it. And Peter decided that he wanted to write a new grant, a separate grant. And this one would be for a deaf poetry series. And there was nothing going on like this anywhere else at the time. And we also had money to invite deaf artists from around the country to come to Rochester and perform. We brought deaf poets in and we had the hearing community involved also, but it wasn't just the interpreting community. You know, traditionally, if there's a deaf event, you always get certain groups of people. You had deaf people, interpreting students, ASL students, and interpreters already working in the field but the greater hearing community wouldn't know anything about it. You know, if there were hearing people there, it was family members. But in Rochester, that isn't what was happening. We brought in Mike Hansen, Marita from Finland, Dennis Bazinski, Malls, Marc Azure, Serge Briere, and Johanna Boulanger. Kenny, Serge, Johanna, and I worked together and developed the Holocaust piece called Only 13. So we'd get together and we would experiment. We would push it and push it every day. And our whole goal was to let go of the actual constructs in the language and have it become art. Have it be kinetic. Don't worry about the function. Just worry about the image. Oh, it was an amazing experience.
we started getting more money from the grants that we wrote every year. And Kenny said, what about the younger people who want to try doing this poetry stuff, but only have a few things? You know, like, I want to do this. Like how I was when I saw Bernard Bragg. What is anyone doing for them? So we thought, well, why not have a rookie night? So that's something we founded. Anybody who wanted could show us their work and we would help them refine it. We would give them feedback and then we would get together on an ongoing basis for rehearsals until everybody felt like they had it to where they wanted it to be. People were starting to recognize that deaf poetry was really cool. It was called deaf poetry at the time, not ASL poetry. There were articles in the newspapers. Mainstream Rochester Press actually had coverage of us, and things were really happening. Peter had moved to Chicago in 1990, and there I was, a hearing person running this deaf poetry series. Didn't feel right. So I decided to end the series with a bang. I'd set up the second ASL poetry conference. Lori Brewer over at NTID suggested that we make it into an ASL literature conference. There should be performances, but also discussions and panels and lectures. The idea was that when people left, they would go back to their high schools and colleges across the country and set up ASL literature programs. It was a huge gathering. The Panera Theater was full every single night. And people really did leave talking about ASL literature. But the Deaf Poetry series was over. Major forces like Jim Cohn, Peter Cook, and Debbie Rennie, they'd left the area and I guess we had no way of knowing it, but that special moment in Rochester history was over. Around that time, I moved to Chicago, and when I got here, I thought, wow, let's set up the scene here. So I started advertising. There was a bar that agreed to let us use their stage, so I got some advertisements around, and nobody came. I mean, that's when it really hit me. Wow. This is not something endemic to all of the U.S. This is something specific to Rochester. No place else. No other place in the U.S. except Rochester had this. That's what was happening. It was just there, and I didn't know. It was very unique. I mean, wow. My goal, really the collective goal for all of us here, is to take ASL poetry and literature and pass it down. We work to analyze and define this art so we can teach it to deaf children and keep it going down through the generations. That is my mission. I feel that in the 1980s, it was as if there was a flower that was blooming. I thought at the time that when that flower blossomed, the seeds would go dispersing out and they would grow. I took those seeds to Sweden with me. Oh, it was inspiring. Experimental. Bird brain. And 
jazz berries, writers and books. I miss that. The more we understand ASL as a language, the greater potential we have to use it for poetry. It's so true and it's crucial. As we dive deep into ASL as a language, we experience its constructs and its richness, and it's from that that poetry will blossom. If it hadn't been for that time, I wouldn't become the interpreter that I am. That time really forced me to dive into the meaning and think about the intention of the poetry and, and come up with images. I'm so grateful for that time because it changed me. It really did change me. I look back at that time and, wow, that time was so precious and unique. The way we all worked together and learned from each other. Such an inspiration. Sharing. And maybe that is the key to the whole thing. The whole idea of poetry, sharing. I just think the mix of things was right, the same way the mix of things was right in the Paris Hotel, you know, uh, um, for the Beats when they were in exile. So we were all sort of in exile from uh, something, I would think, and looking for a way to just be ourselves as poets. With the sign language poetry stuff, you felt like you were part of something historical happening that had needed to happen up until then and would be needed by posterity. And so, you know, you felt like you were really a part of something and, and the parties were good. <laughs> you know, we had a good time. We had a really good time. I think you'll agree with me, Kenny. It isn't our time now. Now it's your turn. Go on, get out there. It's your turn. Go, go. And the flower contracts and then the baby the whole baby opens an eye his cries blast his father off his feet he lands there are eyes fuse and then nirvana nirvana radiates out and he holds it for a moment, and then he pulls it all back together, contracting down into a single teardrop. 